Jack Douglas True Television Series in association with Bing Crosby Productions. Across the Seven Seas, combining the different worlds of travel and adventure, and presenting tonight at home abroad, colorful true travels to the four corners of the earth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. And this is Hollywood, the place that made its name synonymous with motion pictures. The Hollywood that claimed more stars than there are in the skies and treated its stars like figures of history, casting their footprints in concrete and blazing their names even on the city's sidewalks. There was a time when Hollywood made more movies than the rest of the world combined, the film capital of the earth. But today, Hollywood has had to take a back seat to another Hollywood, the Japanese Hollywood. A complete comparison between the two major Hollywoods, one in Japan and the other in America, cannot be made in just 30 minutes. We have tried, however, to pack in as many similarities and dissimilarities as possible in the brief time we have. But in both Hollywoods, the awesome nightmare the filmmakers face is television. And the 64 multi-million dollar question they ask is, can movies and television coexist? The statistics seem to say no, but statistics have been wrong before. It's possible even today, for example, for a strong motion picture to gross more in a year than Gone with the Wind grossed in three years. In the final analysis, only the public will make the ultimate decision. Here once before in our series on a different story, Tokyo, in terms of population, the biggest city on the face of the earth and the lifeline of the Japanese motion picture industry. An industry which today produces some 500 motion pictures a year, an average of almost one and a half feature films a day. India, by the way, is second, and Hollywood isn't even in the top three. But the Japanese moviegoers still wait in line for hours to see the relatively few films Hollywood makes, such as the 101 Dalmatians. Here's the western oldie, but a good one. She wore a yellow ribbon starring John Wayne. They idolize him in Japan. The Hustler with Paul Newman and Jackie Gleason. And El Cid with Lauren and Heston. King Kong vs. Godzilla was produced in Japan, and incidentally, those enormous cutouts are six stories high. From among these many Japanese moviegoers who like American films, we interviewed five who speak English. They are Mr. Dave Hoshimiya, Miss Kimie Tojo, Mr. Ted Hasegawa, Miss Hiroko Furuichi, and Mr. Hitoshi Nikaido. Mr. Hoshimaya, which type of American film do you like best, the action or romance? I would say both types, both action and romantic. Uh, I like a romantic one because I'm a romantic person. No particular preference. I, I like them both. It depends on the story. Both of them. It depends on actors and uh, the quality of the film. I like musical best. Do you prefer a happy or a tragic ending in a film story? I would say, since I'm basically a happy sort, I prefer a happy ending. I prefer a tragic ending. And I think that is a general characteristic of Japanese people. And also, I think that is more uh, true to the life. Again, this depends on the story. Oh, I like happy ending, because it makes me happy. Of course, I like happy ending. Who is your favorite American movie star? Richard Widmark. I liked late Humphrey Bogart. I can't forget his performance in a movie which is called Casablanca. Cary Grant, Spencer Tracy, Edward G. Robinson, Irene Dunn, many, many others. Well, I like Widmark as an actor, and as an actress, Audrey Hepburn. I have no special favorite stars. What is your favorite all-time American movie? Gone with the Wind is my favorite. I liked Limelight. I liked the story. I liked the music. And I think uh, Mr. Charlie Chaplin did a wonderful job. I can't forget his eyes in the movie. A film I saw recently called Pillow Talk with Rock Hudson and Doris Day. I enjoyed this film very much. Uh, Gone with the Wind? 
West Side Story uh, or South Pacific best. Despite their devotion to American films, the Japanese still prefer their own movies by a wide margin. Now the reason has nothing to do with language or national pride, but with the wide variety of Japanese films available to the public, as typified by these posters. French films dubbed in Japanese are also popular, together with a better class of Italian films. But in competing for the foreign markets, Hong Kong is Japan's major rival. The Shaw Brothers studio in Hong Kong is Asia's biggest producing company outside Japan. It specializes in Cantonese and Mandarin films starring actresses like Miss Angelina Ho, and these films get a big play throughout Asia and even in Japan itself. With Miss Ho as our guide, we visited the outdoor set for a new Shaw Brothers film, The Scarlet Mink reputedly the costliest film ever made in Asia. This entire set, still under construction, was made especially for this one film. Next, let's go over to song stage number five, where they are shooting, the lady and the houseboy. Despite Ms. Ho's assurance that we would be welcomed on the set, and we were, we felt that the actors were quite self-conscious, so we tiptoed away. The plot, by the way, smacked of the eternal triangle. Thank you for coming. Please come again soon. Goodbye. The advertising insignias of Japan's major studios also give an indication of their size or type of picture they specialize in. Nikatsu is famed for its superb production facilities. Toho is best known for lavish productions. It's the biggest company in Japan. Daie is noted for the quality of its actors, producers, and directors. This is the studio that produced Rashomon and Gates of Hell, among many others. Shochiku is the studio that has specialized in glamorizing the traditional Japanese drama and Toei runs the gamut from modern-day films to the traditional samurai stories. It's the biggest of the studios devoted exclusively to motion pictures. Any tourist to Japan is welcome to visit the Toei studios, and we took advantage of this long-standing arrangement. But take a tip and wear comfortable walking shoes, because in actual acreage, Toei is as big as the biggest studio in Hollywood, and then some. Toei is as self-sufficient as a studio can get, and of special importance is the wig-making department. These wigs are used mainly in the classic Japanese drama, such as what we might call the samurai pictures. Wig-making in Japan is a highly specialized art, and these men are among the highest paid of all the technicians. In applying the wigs and also makeup, it's the custom in the Japanese film industry for men to make up men and women to make up women. And no star is too big to break that custom. On one of the silent stages, we watched the filming of a typical samurai movie, which corresponds to the American Western melodrama. The small hero there in the center is a girl disguised as a boy. And sure enough, while strolling through the woods, he or she is attacked by robbers. And naturally, he or she puts up a gallant fight until the director hollers, Cut off! During the timeout, the lighting is changed and the hero's hair is neatly combed again. This man is also a good guy. Amban Shuto. And in the story, he hears the shouting and fighting and rushes to the rescue, a sort of samurai Robin Hood of old. The odds be hanged. He takes on all comers, and in no time at all, the last of the robbers takes a whack in the back that flattens him out, at least until the next scene. <laughs> Here on this modest street on the outskirts of Tokyo, we visited the home of one of Japan's most celebrated character actors, a man who has been called the Adolf Manjou and Walter Brennan of Japan. 
He's been a movie star for 40 years. We meet Mr. Tatsuo Saito. Welcome to Japan. It's a pleasure to have you in my home. May I introduce my wife, Mrs. Saito, and my little kid named Tichan. Now, my work in Japanese motion picture industry began in 1924. That time was the silent age, of course. And usually, we have been made 400 pictures about, of course, in year. As my individual actor, I made 35 or 40 pictures in a year. Of course, some of them has been made in rush within three days. Well, most of them, I mean, uh, those Japanese pictures which we have made in that age, male drama and slapstick comedy. Like, uh, oh, you had about some uh, years ago, you know, that uh, Keystone comedy, which uh, been starring Ben Tarpin. Who are some of your favorite American actors and actresses? Well, Frederick March, Paul Mooney, oh, that Gary Cooper. Wonderful actor. Joseph Cotton. Walter Houston. Oh, she was a wonderful actor. And actresses. Gloria Gerson. Betty Davis. And, uh, well, Greta Gabo. Now, has your television hurt the Japanese film industry? Since television we imported, Japanese movie industry getting, you know, lower and lower. That what do you say? Uh, television is really big competitor of Japanese motion picture industry. We thanked the Saitos and waited until the great actor had finished dressing so that we could follow him to the studios of Japan's powerful television network, the NHK, which is government owned. We were greatly impressed with the quality of the cameras, the skill of the technicians, and the size and equipment of the studios. They're as good and as well equipped as the finest TV studios that we have. Mr. Saito has had his own TV series in Japan and is always in demand as a guest star. He takes great pride in the fact that despite his age, he has been able to make the transition from movies to television and that he is a top box office attraction in both mediums. Off camera, Japan's TV actors seemed to relax more than our performers. There's no horseplay, just a relaxed oriental air of cordiality. This particular studio of NHK TV is so big that half a dozen other TV programs are able to rehearse at the same time. And everyone we talked to said yes, TV was hurting the movie industry. Among those who expressed this opinion is Mr. Paul Mizukami, who represents 20th Century Fox of Hollywood in Japan. We asked Mr. Mizukami what restrictions and problems are faced by the American studios distributing films in Japan. Mr. Mizukami. I'm happy to be a guest of your program, Mr. Douglas. And in answer to your first question, the American distributor, the American motion picture distributor, has several restrictions and problems facing him in his work in Japan. First, the number of pictures that we can import into Japan is limited. The number of prints that we can bring in per subject is limited. And the number of, and the amount of money that we can remit to our home office is also limited. One of the biggest problems facing the distributor here in Japan, as elsewhere in, in the world, is television. 
ズを買うとしたら50万はします Well, the Japanese love their own pictures, which is proved by the fact that 70% of the gross theatrical revenue in Japan comes from the Japanese pictures. And、uh, the Japanese motion picture industry is, I think, the most prolific producers of pictures of any country in the world.、Uh, they produce somewhere around 500 pictures, feature pictures a year. Among the Japanese pictures, there is the samurai pictures, the gangster pictures, and the present day drama. Thank you, Mr. Paul Mizukami. These are some of the top stars in Japan's Hollywood. And as we continue looking at their pictures, we're bound to notice that the emphasis is on youth. The great stars of yesteryears, the stars who made many of Japan's finest films, are considered too old. And here again is a striking similarity between Hollywood USA and Hollywood Japan. A new generation is in command, and these are the young people who will carry the box office burdens of the Japanese Hollywood. And these lovely young ladies would do justice to any motion picture screen studio to appear in two films. And this was a luncheon with the American agent who had negotiated the contract. He was perfectly willing to be photographed, but our photographers couldn't care less and concentrated on Miss Okayama. Photographers are like that. Oh, I like、uh, um, soup, uh, soup and tomato cream soup, and、uh, combination salad. In Hollywood, USA, a starlet celebrates a new contract by buying a mink or a convertible. In Japan, it's jewelry. Costume jewelry all the way up to the real thing as the star becomes more and more successful. <laughs> I like this. Her name again is Keiko Okayama. She speaks fairly fluent English, having appeared in nightclubs in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Honolulu. And the chances are that you'll be seeing this gracious young lady soon on the motion picture screen. <laughs> A Japanese film unit on location is no different than any other company shooting away from the home studio. This is a unit from the Toei studio we saw earlier. This particular locale is in the vicinity of Kyoto and Osaka. The particular film is a classical drama. The story of a princess of the royal family fleeing the invaders in the Kamakura period of Japanese history. She is exhausted and falls to the ground. Her grandfather pleads with her to continue, which she will do, but only after some makeup retouching. Now, although the actors spoke the lines, the lines were not recorded, only the cameras were rolling. If they tried to record the sound as well, they'd risk spoiling too many scenes because of auto and plane noises, farmers working in the fields, etc. So, in this case, the dialogue is recorded later separately. The process is known as either looping or wild tracking. <laughs> The actress recording the lines has asked, Shall I speak softly or quite loud? And he replies, Softly, as if out of breath from running. The Japanese went wild over Hollywood type musicals and extravaganzas years ago, and they make excellent musicals. One of the top stars is Inoue Nobuo, whom we met briefly in our story of Tokyo After Dark a few months ago. 
His counterpart in America in stature and popularity would probably be the great Nat King Cole. His style is distinctive, romantic, and his salary is astronomical. To conclude our story on the Japanese Hollywood, we called on Mr. Donald Ritchie, acknowledged even by the Japanese as the foremost critic of the Japanese cinema. He has authored numerous books on the subject, and this is his most recent work. Mr. Ritchie, what do you consider to be the most important and significant aspect of Japanese films? Let's see. You know, I think probably the most important thing of all about the Japanese film, and certainly the thing that keeps my interest in it, and that interests anybody who sees a good Japanese film, is a kind of honesty. A, an honesty of purpose, and an honesty of delineation, and an honesty of craftsmanship, the attitude of the people who make it toward the film, that is very, very rare, because Japanese films show Japan the way that American films never showed America, and that German films never show Germany, or that Russian films don't show Russia. Of course, one of the reasons for this is, is, uh, is obvious. Japan's a rather poor country. They can't afford, you know, big productions usually. When they want to make an outdoor scene, they actually have to go outdoors. If the scene's supposed to be on Ginza, which is the main street here, there's no answer but to take the whole crew to Ginza and actually film it. This makes for a kind of visual honesty, which is quite rare. But there's another kind of honesty, too. And you find this honesty in the, or in the films of, uh, of Ozu, the films of Naruse, the films which, it's too bad, but so many of the Japanese producers feel are too Japanese for Westerners to understand. And this is an honesty about life itself. I mean, the Japanese are honest about life when they insist that life is not one great big happy romp. That life, to be sure, is what you make it. But that life in itself doesn't ensure you anything. This brings in the obligatory, hap or the unhappy ending of the Japanese films, which after all makes just as much sense as anybody else's happy ending does. Thank you very much, Mr. Donald Ritchie.